<laughs> that dogs hate that noise. <laughs> Oh, we killed enough time. Good. So, Scott, you offered to moderate this. I did offer to moderate this because it was my idea. So I came up, we needed ideas for new panels at other conventions that weren't MAGFest, um, like PAX. So I said, hey, you know, uh, lately, as in recent history, you know, uh, well, I guess for all history, right, you make video games, you had to get paid. I guess no one got paid to make Space War. They were just academics or whatever. But, you know, anyone who made games after that had to make money somehow if they were going to make their full-time job, right? Um, so, and it started out where all they did was they had arcades. You'd put 25 cents in per play, and shortly after that, they had buy the game. You pay one big pile of money, you get the whole game, you can play it as much as you want. And those are pretty much the two ways of paying for games pretty much up until the late 90s. When some people started doing subscriptions, and more recently, you've had the microtransactions and the DLC and the iPhone games. And, you know, so recently, it's been like there's a revolution in game paying. You've even got, like, Humble Indie Bundle, pay what you want. You've got, you know, free to play, but pay for upgrades. you got all this stuff going on. Hats, the hat-based economy hat is very popular. Hat-based economies, <laughs> right? You know, there's, there's all these crazy ways to pay for video games that have happened recently. And I've noticed, and I don't know if anyone else has noticed, that the way a game is paid for has a huge effect on the game itself. Like, you know, if you're making an arcade game that's gonna be paid for a quarter at a time, right? Well, then you're gonna make a different kind of game because of that. Your game design decisions as a game maker are hugely affected by the way you're making money if you care about how much money you make. Some people don't. Um, so, uh, it was originally gonna be like a lecture about this, but we needed another like discussing panel. So I said, hey, let's just use that idea and see what comes up, and then it'll be easier to write the lecture panel later. <laughs> so so you, how, do you, how do we want to We should probably this? introduce ourselves. At oh, first. that's a good idea. So yeah. people know who we are. Oh, man, you're genius. I mean, for, for all they know, the we're, just, we had you we're, just three, we're just three guys who like, showed came up in. and killed the, uh, the guys who are supposed to present. Right. That's how we got our first panel ever. Right, so anyway, so I'm, uh, I'm Scott. I'm one of two hosts of the Geek Nights podcast. Uh, I have saved games older than most of you. <laughs> I'm Rim, I'm the other half of the Geek Nights podcast, and we lecture widely on games with more or less academia involved, depending on the venue. And now we're here. Yeah. And I'm Chris Hazard, I run Hazard Software. Uh, we make the RTS Acron, if anyone has heard of that, Time Travel RTS. I also hold a PhD in computer science, specifically game theory with respect to e commerce. And so I do a lot of research in there. And I also do a lot of work with serious games, with the military and with uh, the commercial market. So I wear a lot of different hats. Translation. He's right and we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they won't be happy, though. Half the people in this crowd were in the other panel where every time we were like, yeah, game theory, half the audience was like, oh, not this again. <laughs> So, so do you want to, let, let's go down, like, you know, payment method by payment method, right? So I guess if you're making a game for free, you're just giving it away, right? How is that going to affect how you think, you know, the game designer? Well, to begin with, if you're giving you a game away for free, you have some objective. Is it for the most number of people to play it, or is it for, to make some sort of artistic or propaganda impact? Mm -hmm. And so each of those different roles means something different. If you're trying to get the maximum number of people to play, if you're a new game designer and uh, you want to make a name for yourself, you want to entice them as much as you can, but you also want to have a, have a good replay or a good multiplayer or something that people can share and collaborate with to leverage a social network, because I'm assuming that you have no capital to invest towards marketing. it. So it's got to be something that has the sort of, kind of, like, look at the kind of memes that will flow. It's almost like it's meme juice, it's Google juice. What is, like, pirates and zombies and ninjas are things that are popular at different times. Right now, if you made, like, a My Little Pony platformer, or a <laughs> Doctor Who, a game where you just stole someone else's IP, like Doctor Who, just to get it out there. But that's more like that's more the sort of like the proper nouns of the game, not the design of the game. Yeah, I guess there's also you know some people might just want you know they might necessarily want to make a name for themselves or you know push a message out, but they might just literally just want to bring you know create a feeling in people, just you know make give people enjoyment or make people suffer. Right? Like, you know, some people make, like, those horrible, impossible-to-beat games for free. And it's like, I just want to see people suffer their shame for it. And, you know, like, like, the hardest game imaginable. So I think it does have one pressure in that you don't have a lot of resources, generally, unless you're a self-made millionaire or billionaire or, you know, flush fund kitty. <laughs> and so you, you have a lot smaller um, of a game in general, I think. Oh, there's also, I guess, the possibility you could be one of those like open source games where you're trying to make a technological development on the software side. You see, like a lot of like those open source FPSs, like uh, the Cube, 
and things like that. Because I found games like that tend to have like a really neat concept, but they're never they're either not executed well or there's nothing else around it. Like they lack all the basic polish of a game. Mm -hmm. And even a lot of indie games have that problem. Like uh, Binding of Isaac, I just played recently, and the only way I can describe has anyone played the Binding of Isaac? I thought it was more popular than it was. Only about half the people here have played it, and a lot of people have never heard of it. It's a Robotron shooter set in a Zelda 1 dungeon world, but it's actually mechanically more like NetHack than anything. But yeah, but you know, the thing is, is like, you know, technologically speaking. Oh, but what right? I was getting at is it's yeah. a Robotron shooter where it doesn't support gamepads at all. Like it's <laughs> lacking all these fundamental like parts of the game. Before we even talk about the design of the game itself, like the basic components of a video game were missing from it. But yet it's very popular anyway. Well, I see that mostly a lot of indie games have network play, but the network code is all broken. And it's like, well, you, you, you fundament the first thing is to make it work, and the game doesn't work. And so, so one interesting thing about that is uh, uh, NAT. So if you have a router, you have maybe five computers with your, your roommates or things like that, and that all goes on to, down to one IP address. Now, there is a standard it's called UPnP to allow your router to talk to all these other routers and, or, or to, to map the incoming connections back to yours. However, that standard doesn't work all the time. No, yep, no, no. in fact, most uh, kind of nerds, well, like, I disabled it because I don't want any device in my network tunneling out and doing stuff without my permission. Right. So half these games won't work unless I go in and set up port forwarding, and that's actually beyond the means of most people. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. I just happen to know how There's to do a, it. But the thing it, is, it, the thing is, Skype does it, right? right. There now, is a way to make it work. It works in Skype. Everyone else can just do the same thing Skype does. Now, Skype is extremely complicated in, how, in terms it of how is. they do that, though. I mean, they have, uh, they'll have they look for super nodes. They find route, people who have routers that can do that, and they have this whole topology that routes around these things. If you're an indie developer, you're going to spend six, six months to a year developing just that. Well, and mean, it, the big studios don't generally use that. There's also a lot of latency with that. Too. Yep. The big studios do one of two things. They either have large um, software suites that do every possible configuration and store all sorts of routers and all these edge cases, or they have um, servers that they run where they just pay for tons and tons of bandwidth so everybody connects to them as a server. And uh, yeah, that's the, the thing is. Everything. Well, this the is thing, what bothers me about the, the different. You know, yeah, as, a tangent, but that's okay. As consoles and PCs have diverged and come back together and diverged again, PCs have always had a huge advantage in that front, and that if you want to do a multiplayer game, you can let the players run the servers, and we found throughout history that they will gladly run servers. They'll yeah. run more. You will never have to run a single official server in your life. Yeah. And then you have a server client model, and you don't care because clients can be behind a net, and the server will never care. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, just to, to wrap up this completely off topic tangent, right? <laughs> the fact that network play, right? For all, you know, you have nets, we have routers, you have Skype, you have all these, you know, crazy things, but Quake World still works. Quake Word still works with modern technology. It's open source. It was a client-server model. There's no reason for a modern game not to, at least at the bare minimum, just use the code from Quake World. So Quake World was a client-server client game, right. exactly. not a peer-to-peer -peer game. So someone just runs the server, though. You need people. It's, yeah, you know. And that person who runs the server needs to make sure that it's configured properly. Right, but only one person has to do that. Right. Not, it's not like every game player needs to manage all this technology. You, just, you have to have one smart PC friend. But that works for the hardcore. I mean, right. I play Counter-Strike, I can run a Counter-Strike server. But the thing is, one guy, some other guy you don't even know can just run the server and have it on his website listed. You don't. It doesn't need to be the players, you know? But then your game needs critical mass, and you need to have, you know... It, it, the well, fan base grows. Well, let's, let's get back on topic, right? So if you have some sort of some sort of networked, you know, multiplayer game, you know, depending on how the servers are laid out, right, then that actually affects how you need to get the game paid for. Because not only do you need to pay to develop the game, you need to pay to run servers or someone else is running them. Now, servers are getting cheaper, but it, the type of game makes a big difference, too. For example, Akron, we couldn't host because it would be, it'd be just so expensive for us to do so. Um, it, you know, a lot of games, like if you think of MMOs, the n a number of transactions that they need to do with the database is very, very small. I mean, you're talking... You level up, we uh, increment a number. Right, know, exactly. And a couple it. messages that go back and forth between the servers. Very minimal. Versus if you're talking about an RTS or an MMO RTS, you've got a lot of messages going back and forth. So that's something that you need to consider, both in terms of bandwidth and in terms of the number of servers you have on cloud computing. There's also client trust. Like MMOs, players really, like the statefulness of the game is what they primarily care about. Like if, if their character wouldn't have an item that they got before or a transaction got lost, or if some other player cheated and had a whole bunch of money, then they wouldn't like that. So as a result, you have to put most of the logic on the server side, and you have to do you know comparisons and checksums to make sure that no clients are cheating. Maybe a more indie game or a smaller game, you don't care as much, because if four guys are playing a cheating game, who cares? People might just play with their friends. So whether or not you even care about cheating actually seems to be a part of how your game is funded. Right. Now, eSports, that's another monetization technique. 
So now if you want to make sure that people are, uh, they can win competitions, you want to make sure that the clients are validated, that they're not cheating, that they're not having bots, aim, aim bots or things like that, that changes the way you design the game a little bit too and adds a lot more cost in terms of, and um, uh, there's different models with that. There's the client server models we talked about before. There's one server that contains all the data and everyone else is reading off of that. But then you have latency because that server needs to communicate with all of the different clients and, and uh, there's round trip for everything. Another model which is widely used is that every player has a copy of the game and they synchronize each other to make sure they're all on the same page. Uh, StarCraft, remember, remember it was when it was synchronizing or um, different first person shooters, especially if you have a lot of lag. If you're sitting there playing in Australia against a guy in, in um, I don't know, in Sealand, um, you have a lot of latency. <laughs> so well, you'll shoot somebody and they might hit, but then you'll all of a sudden you'll see the new world update and, and jostle a bit. Now, some of the old games, you know, that syncing is not an easy problem to solve, especially if you're worried about latency. Like, Command & Conquer 1 could get out of sync, where I would be playing a game over modem with someone, and they would see a different thing from what I saw because the game didn't actually update in both sides correctly. And then it would crash. <laughs> but, you know, the point is, if you need these central servers, right, you need some way to pay to keep them running. You need, you know, IT staff to manage them constantly, right? You know, mm -hmm. if I make a game that's a one-shot game, like, you know, I just sell it, and that's it, I can fire everyone the day after that game is in stores. Actually, you can't. But is there a law? Support. Oh, I guess there's support, right? But, right. You know, but I've you never can, actually but called. But those aren't developers for the support. Those mm -hmm. are customer service people. In my entire life, for a game I have purchased, I have never sought out or gotten support of any kind. So the difference is that uh, you still need those people because nowadays, especially console games, console games are being patched just like PC uh, games. But in the olden days, they weren't. But right. now... Now they are. Because of all the... There's a couple of pressures going on. You have the... Uh, the high budgets that we need all the stuff in the game and uh, then you have the financial pressure where it's not two guys making a, a game in the early 90s you have an entire team of 500 people or thousands of people even if it's a smaller game because they'll work for several months and they'll compress some of the schedule so now you have some uh, some guys pulling the, the purse strings saying we need this game out now and I'm sorry but because of some investment decisions you need to, to retract your schedule a little bit compact it testing is one of the first things that gets cut Yep. So now you have to you say, okay, well, we're just not going to test as much. We're going to patch it later. So now you have to have your development staff stay on board. And crunch time used to be up until you release, until you went gold. Now crunch time stays for several months after the game is released. Yeah, well, I mean, but you look at, say, Nintendo, right? Nintendo still refuses to, to cut back, right? Like, you know, when, uh, Skyward Sword took them five years because Nintendo, you know, they don't want to patch anything, right? They want to put out something and have it be completely I think done. that's a function primarily of capital. But even, yes. But right. Patch it, but even so, they still had a problem, <laughs> right. right? And they had to find some funky way to patch it because they didn't even incorporate patching into their system. They were so confident in their extensive well, I'll put it this way. You know, my, my day job is I'm a product manager for a company. We design software and I manage all that. And I've decided in my professional career, it is impossible to release any complex product of any type, be it a physical widget, a game, software, anything, without not just, you know, no bugs. No bugs is like ludicrously impossible. Without serious bugs of some kind, it is pretty much impossible. One of my faculty members in undergrad used to take uh, software and inject bugs in it. And then measure, they put it through the testing process and see what percentage of the bugs they caught that were injected versus the ones that are in there. And that gives you an idea as how many loose bugs are in the system yet. Oh, very interesting. Oh, yeah. And you could, you, it's safe to inject them because you know to remove them. Exactly. Because you've got the reverse patch in like another branch. But then again, I could easily see that going awry. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oops. With an incentive structure. <laughs> But I mean, you'd also have to take into account like how obscure the bug. I could put, you know, if I'm writing a bug, I could make it like the game will crash on a blue moon on the third Tuesday at 2 a.m. if you're in this level and you have exactly 642 coins and you hit the rock with your sword from the left. You know, it's like, I know no one's gonna find that. That that would get caught in code review though, because someone's like, what's this gigantic inventory? <laughs> I had to run through my obfuscator. <laughs> like, I put it in those comments, like, if you don't understand this, don't touch it. You know? <laughs> so that, that reminds me, one, one thing that we have not seen in terms of monetization in games yet is, uh, is hacking. So if you think of all the back doors that happen in different pieces of software, uh, yeah, I remember when I was an undergrad, I was thinking, the possibility of downloading an MP3 and, and playing it on your computer and having that hijack your computer was ludicrous. Who could possibly imagine that? Well, there then, had to be a vulnerability in your MP3 that, playing exactly. software. That was like before there is buffer, an Acrobat reader. Buffer overflows were, right. were really well known. Now there's all these techniques where you could look at a picture and that can crash your computer. That could root it or that could or, escalate yeah. privileges. So, 
that has not really happened much with games yet. And I think a big reason of that is because games are very large, complex pieces of software, which are you only run for a few months. On average, the game is, uh, an average game is played about three or four months before it's discarded effectively in the market. Now, now that we have a lot more games yes. that are using the same engine, are there exploits there? And could we start seeing, um, you know, oh, let's, let's go play with this guy. Yeah, this I mean, guy has if a, you could hit, say, Unity or the Unreal Engine, right? right? You could hit phones and computers and consoles, and, you know, if it's a, if it's a bug that goes across the board. So now there's a monetization scheme of people hijacking computers through games. Well, there were there is already an existing monetization scheme of selling uh, like cheats, like you know, mm -hmm. pay, pay me money and I'll give you these Counter Strike cheats I just wrote that aren't you know that Valve hasn't accounted. Not for even yet. that. For a long time, when you could make executable flash files, there were tons of Trojans and executable that run a little flash game and also install malware on your PC. That's been going on for ten years, mm -hmm. and that's a monetization model. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, but let, let's talk about the more recent stuff. So more recently, obviously, right? You know, people have been you know selling iPhone games for a dollar, or they've been giving a game for free and selling you levels. Or actually, let me let me interrupt you there about right. iPhone games for a dollar. Okay, that was as a game developer, that was one of the things that really angered me about Apple. Was they sorted by number initially on the App Store, sorted by number of products sold. If you want to, if you want to appear in the list and be uh, have a chance of appearing in there, you have to sell a lot. How do you do that? Sell it for ninety nine cents. Yeah. That's the only way. Free. What that did was that dropped the price of games considerably in the casual market. Um, and basically, I know a lot of my friends were getting out of the market saying, "There's you know, there's this huge gold rush. Now there's no money because you have to sell it for ninety nine cents. And if, if you can't move tons of units." It's not worth it. Yeah. Apple tried to, to pull that back a little bit and say, well, let's maybe sort by revenue, total revenue, which they is have, a much they have better. They two lists now. There's like top, there's top free, top paid, and top grossing. Right. So you'll see like Infinity Blade, which is eight bucks, is always on top grossing, but mm -hmm. it's never on top free or top paid or you know top paid ever. Right. But uh, they, they they tried fixing that, and it's I think the game market is still recuperating a little bit because there's there's such an exodus of developers for that, and it really jostled the market. I think in a bad way. Uh -huh. I think there's a sidelong problem there that when we talk about games, you know the Spectrum goes all the way from things that aren't even, like, I would almost hesitate to call them games by any of the definitions I use usually when we do these kind of panels. Like some of the stuff Zynga puts out, all the way up to, you know, five-star blockbuster, $10 million budget games. Ten and that's small. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if it's worth to even, I mean, it's hard to say, oh, that's a hardcore game, that's a casual game, because you can't really, like, that's a judgment call at that point. But some, like, the very cheap games exist in an entirely different ecosystem from the blockbusters, because the blockbusters go after a smaller target audience that is dedicated to a genre. I mean, Half-Life 3, everyone who cares about FPS is going to buy that game. Grandma's not going to buy that game. Well, you know, the thing is... They don't though, compete. I guess I'm saying they don't compete with each other, I don't think. The thing with the dollar games, though, is it's like, it's always weird to see people upset that they can't sell things for a high price anymore. Well, it's like, well, you can just sell more of them, right? It's like, look at Nintendo. They, you know, they, they put out a $50 game because they, you know, and they say because they don't want to, like, change the, the uh, like, the perceived value of the game, right? Like, you, th you know, if you drink two wines, you know, one is, you think one is more expensive, it will taste better psychologically, right? You know, just, you know, based on the label. So it's like, well, if we sell our game for $50, people will like the game better, you know? Well, so a couple of things with but that. But what if they made Skyward Sword 20 bucks? Wouldn't they? They would sell more than three times. Would they, though? I think they would. Absolutely. So one thing with that is look at, look at the cost of entertainment per hour. Yeah. You go to a movie, you pay $10, $12, whatever your movie theater is, you get an hour and a half, two hours of entertainment, and that's it. Crying you, babies. And you spend that same amount in a game, you get maybe 30 hours of entertainment. Well, there's times. a Steam calculator we were just looking at, and while it was a little inaccurate, it would calculate based on what you paid for all your games and the hours you spent on each one, what amount of money you were paying per hour for that entertainment. I was paying like .08 cents an hour for <laughs> entertainment, and I've only played 13% of the games I own. Well, I think it was, yeah, a lot of my games, I can say that the I see many of you are in the same boat as <laughs> it said that the game I played the most, though, was like Half-Life 1, which is totally untrue, because I beat Half-Life 2 like three times in Half-Life 1. It said I put times. in about 700 hours of Counter-Strike, which and is... It, it, it didn't track nearly as many of my Counter-Strike hours, because I've been playing Counter-Strike since, you know, 01, 00. That's right, Grandpa. Right, 12 years, and it was only tracking like three years worth of Counter-Strike, and I was like, well, that's not even close to correct. But I think the market is diluted, just that there's so many entertainment options that it's not... You know, when I was a kid, I had one NES game. I would play that no matter what. I'd pay $70 to get Zelda 2 and $65 to get Mario 3. Well, there is one thing I have noticed, though, is that when Steam started doing the Uber discounts, I was like, finally, someone gets it, right? And they were even saying that they got it, straight up. They were like, yeah, look, we have this huge piracy in Russia. 
we lowered our prices and, and we put the games out on the same day they came out in the US. And look, Russian piracy dropped off the board and people are buying games like crazy and they have crazy sales and I was buying games like crazy. But now they did that for a few years and I was buying games like crazy. I was like, finally, someone gets it. Five bucks for a real game. And now you own 800 games. Now I own 800 <laughs> games. I'm not even, the Steam sale, I didn't buy almost anything. I bought like two games this year for like a couple bucks because I already had a zillion games. I was not, I don't have time to play them all. I've barely played any of them. So would you agree? I'm just curious because I think, I, I think about this a lot. And I've made a lot of arguments to this effect that currently game, all media, but games, we're talking about games, we're talking about games. Games, the problem with piracy is not nearly as bad as the problem with the existing library of games. You're competing with the past. And the past is such a history of gaming now that there are already more games in existence than I could ever play if I spent every waking hour of the next 80 years of my life playing them. So already there's too much for me to possibly consume. So already every game that comes out has to not just beat every game this year, but every game that has ever been made in the history of games. So then on top of that, you have to spend all this extra money to build those games to beat those old games, which makes them more expensive. But I can sell the old game for 10 cents because it costs me nothing. I, it's already been paid for. It's just IP that someone owns. This leads into price discrimination. So as a business owner, the, what you'd like to do is you'd like the people who want your product the most to pay the most for it. The ones who will, you know, I'm only going to pay 10 cents for this, we'll pay 10 cents. There's another other guy who's like, I want this game no matter what, I'll pay $1,000 for it. You want to extract as much of that as you can. However, if you do that, people, don't, people in general don't like that because they don't like to say, well, wait, I paid 10 cents and the, or I paid $1,000, that guy paid 10 cents. I'm mad. So yeah. it's, it's the way that, that businesses usually do this is they drop the price. So you start it off at a high price and then the most loyal, the most fierce customers will come in and buy it. And then you slowly drop it down. And I, I talked um, earlier today about trust and reputation and how you drop your prices and, and how you also include how bonus extras with the pre-release, right. right? Here, you can have the, you know, the underwear that comes in the box. <laughs> <laughs> and so what you want to do is, is in the, the time frame that your game is popular, you want to hit all of the price points that you can such that everyone bites at that point. That's how you maximize your revenue. But are they not also training us? Because two examples, when Fallout 3 came out, I bought it day one, yep. and I didn't play it for six months. And then <laughs> I, I, it, I played it three months later. And then I finally played it, and it was like half the price. Deus Ex came out. I looked at it, like, oh, I really want to play that. And I waited, and I, I finally bought it when it was fourteen ninety nine. Yeah. I still haven't played it. <laughs> They're training me to wait. They're saying, look, wait a few months, and the price will go down. Yeah. So that means I'll have to make the curve steeper, and then I'll wait. I'll always get the game at the same cheap price point. Yeah. Now it's less relevant, so you're competing with more historical well, games. Yep. Here's another mistake that's really confusing the hell out of me, right? So Fallout 3, when it first came out, I paid 50 bucks. I didn't play it for a few months. I played the whole thing. Then there were DLCs, right, which were five bucks each as they came out, right? And then they had a Game of the Year edition, which included all the DLCs ever and was 20 bucks. So it's like, well, you're supposed to include the bonus goodies for the people who paid the most, not for waiting later. So it's like, not only is it if you buy it later, it'll cost less, it's buy it later and get more and not have to buy all these DLCs. So now New Vegas came out and New Vegas was on super sale in the Steam sale on this holiday season, but it wasn't Game of the Year edition that included all the DLCs. I'm like, I am not buying that game until it gets every single DLC is included with it. All media has this problem. At anime, back in the day, I would spend like $140 on a VHS box set. And then one day, like you could buy box sets for like 20, 30, $40. That was awesome, I bought a lot of anime. The other day I was looking at Amazon, I saw a pretty good show that I really had liked. It was called, it was Gunkutsuo, The Count of Monte Cristo. I really liked that show, it was a solid B anime. It was eight dollars for the box set. I looked at that and I said, eight dollars. <laughs> and I didn't buy it. <laughs> I didn't pirate it. I just didn't buy it. The eight dollars was is, still too much. I think though what they need to do to fix this problem is like, look, if you pay 50 bucks the day it comes out, you get all DLCs ever for free. Mm -hmm. And if then in the future, after the price drops, then the DLCs cost extra, right? So it's like the guy who buys it up front should get all the DLCs for free. Then I would actually maybe pay the fifty bucks if I know there's never going to be a game. But here's the subscription model: uh, right. to subscribe to Half Life. Mm -hmm. That's actually a pretty good model. Except they I... didn't keep. No, everyone talks about that, but who has actually done it? Right? Who mm -hmm. actually keeps coming out with episodes and never stops? Because that's what they were thinking when they started DLCs, like Sam and Max. But they didn't. You have to keep making episodes forever. You cannot stop. I would like to. I think I know why that's the case. Because a lot of games and comics have the same problem. They keep like doing parallel media. There's a comic called Black Bastard, and it is this awesome like black exploitation, like super cool thing. I looked at the cover, and I got everything I needed to get out of that comic. I didn't actually read it. So I found. 
So I found that games are kind of the same way. When a game introduces a new mechanic, unless the mechanic is really crunchy and really deep, like Akron has a pretty deep and crunchy mechanic, but a lot of games like Binding of Isaac, I play it twice, I know the deal. I get less and less enjoyment every time I play it, so there's no way I'm gonna buy more games in that series because they're not giving me more. The demo of the sequel will give me everything I need from so the So I've game. said this before in some of my other panels, and hate, I hate to repeat myself, but demos hurt sales. Oh! Statistically. We, we were at PAX and someone yeah. gave a lecture on this. They basically said that... They, they, we didn't see the lecture. Some, our yes. friend did. So he this told is us what the guy yeah. said. Second hand. Yeah. It's hearsay. That they studied whether or not you do a trailer, a demo, or both a trailer and a demo. Trailer made sales go up. Demo made sales go way down. Demo and trailer made sales go way down. <laughs> it's because like, it's exactly what we just said. If there's mm -hmm. a demo for the game, you play it and you get everything you need to get out of that demo. It's like, well, I know everything there is to know about this game, so I don't need to pay for it. Unless yeah. you're one of those people who seeks out mastery. We were talking about mm -hmm. the different types of gamers in that other panel. Like someone might play the demo Super Meat Boy. Oh, it's a platformer. That was cool. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Or I'll sit there and beat the whole goddamn game because I want that. So I have to be careful talking about this because uh, of NDAs, but one of the, the big game companies, uh, uh, just something that I've heard is that people who have a, a PS3, who have Xbox 360, whatever sitting in their living room, they are more likely now to be playing their handheld game in their kitchen when that game console is sitting right there. And they'll spend more time playing those handhelds. I'm definitely guilty of that. I play my DS, and the only game I play on it is Advance Wars. I probably play more Angry Birds in the bathroom than Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is funnier than being in the bathroom at work and hearing the Angry, angry Birds move music start up, and then a shuffling, and it suddenly stops. <laughs> Blackbird's the best. I guess we should, because I, I guess the panel, we were going to talk a little bit about game design choices. So we should, let's talk about actual, like, design choices in games, like World of Warcraft. Well, well something I've noticed, right, is that, uh, you know, when you make the subscription game, right, they purposely make the game in such a way that there is, you know, like, never-ending gameplay. There's some, there's always something to do. There's multiple different things to do. Look at the level inflation in World of Warcraft. They have to keep raising the level cap to give people more stuff to do. Yeah, and like they have to keep creating more and more content, but they try to create as little as possible, and they always find new ways to like get more out of it. Like, okay, well, here's the thing: so people can PvP if they want, and some people can do this, and so many different things to do in the game. So even if you've maxed out one area, there's another area, and they reuse as much content as possible, to like extract every dollar out of every model and map and, and thing that they possibly can. And you don't want negative feedback because that that annoys players to death too. Yep. Negative feedback is when um, you're getting punished for being successful. If anyone remembers the first F Zero, when the the guy behind you would always be right behind you, no matter no how good you were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, something else I've noticed is that in any games, you know, a lot of games now they don't want to have any real competition. Mm -hmm. You know, like like Bejeweled Blitz, it's like is the closest you're going to see to real competition in like a modern sort of casualish game where you can see your friends' scores. Well, look at the evolution. Old games, like the games that were most popular in arcades, were actually like they were in bars aimed at adults, and they were directly versus games. People would sit there and either indirectly versus pong, like pong, like Pac-Man, you know, versus or whatever. You know, I play Dig Dug, you play Dig Dug while we're drinking, but like Pong and Outlaw and all these games. And that was when games were marketed at gamers. Gamers were the ones who were going to go play these games. And now, they're, you know, we've widened the market to the point there are a lot of people who just don't like competition. A lot of people don't like to play a game where you know, they have to level up their skill, their actual personal skill, not just hours into the game makes them better. It's hours of actually getting better makes them better. But conf uh, in conflicting to that, everyone wants to be the hero, too. So how do you have everybody be the hero but have no conflict well, that was the among problem. That was the problem with the first Star Wars Galaxies. Everyone wanted to be the Jedi. They wanted there to only be a few Jedi, so it'd be more like it was real, but that didn't work. And then it failed. Yep. And now the thing is, the new one actually looks like the first thing that might beat WoW, not because it's necessarily better, I haven't played it, but because WoW has just been not updating and it's sort of been, okay, it's old enough that it can't you know, go on forever. There's a time limit on everything. All right. I, mean, do I don't you know. Really, do you really think you know World of Warcraft could do something that would sort of bring it back, to, you know, to be just as gigantic as it was in its its? It's tricky because look at the constraints of the game. World of Warcraft could not reboot like old MMOs used to reboot. They'd every now and then like they'd have a cataclysm. They'd say, "All right, everybody's dead. Everybody's level one. Let's start over." I think like eighty percent of WoW's subscription base would never come back if that happened, mm -hmm. because I, I know a lot of people who keep paying for WoW. They don't play it at all anymore. In fact, they talk about how much they hate it now. But they don't want to give up their character. Just some numbers in a database. 
It's like, really? Update. You know, one update SQL command. But think about it. The monetization model has constrained the game. You could, you can't do, like, really big changes to this game, or you'll anger the player base probably enough to lose so many of them that you wouldn't make money anymore. This is an interesting legal question, too, about intellectual property or digital property ownership. That it hasn't really been tested out in court. But Not at all. The, the, it's, is it property? It's a row in a database. Right. Wow. Um, this is old. So is my like, bank account. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> like four years ago, uh, there's a paper out that found that Wow was um, had a larger GDP than many third world countries. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Something I've always wanted to see, though, is like just someone try. You know, they've so far they tried free to play and subscription because you need to keep the servers up. You can't just do the one charge and then free forever. Like I think the first Guild Wars did that and it didn't work. Right. I want to see someone do the arcade, right? Every time you die, you pay 25 cents to come back, right? That's what I, I think it could work. Mm -hmm. I think it, no one's trying, you know, no one's experimenting. There's sort of, you know, one person does something that's sort of obvious, and everyone just sees that they made a lot of money and copies them. So part of that is the risk aversion of the gaming industry. When you say something like, you, you have to pay when you die, now are you going to have adverse selection where the only people playing your game are going to be the, the people who are really good, and now you're not going to make much die. money. They never die. Right. But then the thing is you have to do the same things that they did in the arcade in the olden days, make the game balls hard. You're dying all the time. But so then again, your market. yeah, that turns, that turns the casual gamers away. That turns the medium gamers away. It turns away the people who are really hardcore, who are hardcore about something that isn't what you're testing. Because remember, a game has a test of skill. You're testing some skill. The, you could almost say the mechanics of the game is the list of what skills matter in this game. In Counter-Strike, clicking on heads and strategy matter a lot. In Halo, the clicking on heads doesn't matter as much. The aiming is actually a lot more forgiving, and other factors matter more. So if I make a game that cares about clicking on heads and I make that super hardcore, everyone who doesn't care about head clicking is not going to play my game. Well, there's also a strategy with that, too. So you have a certain measure of skill, but then there's a certain measure of skill with respect to other players and the metagame. And that can change the game drastically as well. Very much so. So another thing I was thinking is, uh, I totally forgot. Oh, right. So you know how like a lot of MMOs, people do like pirated servers. And the MMO companies hate that stuff so much. They're like, oh my god, no one's even paying. They just got the client pirated. An MMO where they sell you for 100 bucks, you can run a server for up to 12 of your friends. Or here, here we'll let is. you run an official pirated server. We take 50% of the monies of all the people playing on your servers. You know, it's like no one even tries that or even thinks to try that. They're just like, pirated server, shut them down. And it's like, what do you mean? They're, they're providing you with hardware for nothing. And people are playing. If you just made it official, all the pirated servers. Here's would go one away. reason why: a lot of players who play games like World of Warcraft, any sort of like stateful and massively multiplayer online role-playing game, they care a lot about fairness. If they feel like, look at how much people hate gold farmers, especially or not even gold farmers, people who actually pay for the gold. If I buy a level seventy character and people know that, they hate me, <laughs> even though it doesn't affect them in any way. So if you let someone play on the pirated server and bless that as being okay, then, oh, those guys don't have to grind. They just play whatever level they want. That's not fair. And you'll anger your existing players who are just paying you a straight-up subscription fee. And they may be playing a different game, too, because they have a pirated server. They will not get the updates. They'll be maybe playing an old version of the game. Well, I mean, I mean but if it's a blessed official release, right. you're giving them the software. But then you have to trust their admin. What if he just doesn't right. update it? He right. dies. And the server's just still running on his credit card for another six months. <laughs> If it's an official thing that you have blessed, mm -hmm. you could have the backups coming to you automatically from it. You could, there are lots of technological solutions to that. Is the moral here just that how come people aren't experimenting with more models in general? Risk, like I said before, yeah. risk aversion. Well, look, look at Inception, the movie. Inception almost didn't happen. It was one of the most popular movies in recent history, and yet it was kind of a fluke that it happened because a movie like Garfield, there's a great article about this a few months ago. The Garfield movie made every dollar it was going to make before the script was written. Get, movies like that are designed to sell based on the name because, you know, parents will take their kids to see the Garfield movie. People know Garfield. A certain number of people are going to go see it no matter what. Execution doesn't matter. It could be the worst movie in the world. They, everyone might hate it and say it was bad, but they all went to see it at least once and those same people make another movie. It's not Garfield 2. It's some other franchise. So people can't say, oh, Garfield was bad. I won't go see X. Yep, there's some guy calculating... This, you know, particular licensed property has this many fans and therefore, you know, it'll make this many dollars. So we're going to set a budget at X and make a thing in this medium for that licensed property. And we will get this much profit, almost guaranteed with 90% certainty. Do it. It doesn't matter if it's good. It doesn't matter if it's bad. It doesn't matter who's in it. You know, it's... it's so so it. some of the companies, if you have a number of uh, criteria or a number of pieces of data about what the game is going to be, the IP, they can predict within 10,000 sales the number that will be sold for a particular IP. And they're accurate. And they're accurate. Very accurate. What's cool, that same stuff is being used for like foreign policy predictions and war <laughs> outcomes and elections. And 
It's very scary. All right, so uh, let's talk about, you know, how, uh, you know, in games right now, people are paying for, like, you know, bonuses to their characters, right? Because you look at TF2 and you make fun of the hats, right? But hats don't really do anything. They just make you look different. So but, I'm like, still... in League of Legends, you get a skin or something. I'm still do doing anything. the research because this industry is really freaking secretive about its numbers. This yes. is one of the big problems I have with talking about this stuff. Like, we had a huge email argument where I have a whole bunch of hypotheses and theories as to, like, how gamers are affected by all these things, but there's almost no legitimate research on it, so I'm basically guessing and, like, filling out this list of anecdotal evidence, and there's a huge cloud in the right. middle of, well, I guess. Right, but then this game's, like, Gunbound, which are pretty, it's like, if you don't know Gunbound, it's sort of like one of those aim... It's Scorched Earth. It's Scorched Earth, <laughs> but it's a Korean multiplayer thing, and it's literally... Pay money for a better tank. If you pay a bunch of money, your tank not only looks cooler, but it shoots bigger bombs and you have auto-aim and all this stuff. As an aside event, has anyone heard of the game Upgrade Complete? Really fascinating uh, uh, <laughs> game where you, you, you start off playing this game, looks like it's from maybe late 1980s or something like that, and when you progress through the game and get power-ups, it upgrades parts of the game. It'll upgrade the graphics, it'll upgrade the sound, it'll upgrade all of your ancillary experiences. It's kind of neat. Yep. So is there, because I, is there a material difference do you think, and then we can debate this, because I, between the hats in Team Fortress 2, which are purely cosmetic, they have no impact on gameplay. They might cloak you in certain maps. Yeah, you could argue, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could argue there, there are slight effects. Like, if you play, uh, what's his name, in GoldenEye. Oh, odd yeah, job. Odd job. slightly shorter. So if I get a hat that's a bright color, I'm actually making myself worse, because I stand out. But I might like bid a red hat on a blue character, and I might be able to fool you into thinking about the other team for like a fraction of a second. <laughs> yep. But they so they affect the game mechanically a little bit, but they're primarily just style. And you could theoretically come up with flavor, like in a turn-based game, where it literally has zero effect on the game for all intents and purposes. Yeah, if I'm playing Advance Wars and it looks all Christmas styling, and you're playing Advance Wars and it looks like the desert, it doesn't affect the For game you at as all. players, is it materially different to you? if you can buy things that actually affect the game, even if there's so-called balance. Like in Team Fortress 2, you can unlock or buy an item that isn't fundamentally better, but it is different. It gives a tactical option that you didn't have, thus making the game unfair. Raise your hand if that bothers you more than the skins only. Some people are bothered. So some people, so see, some people are bothered, and some people aren't bothered when you can play a test of skill, a versus game where someone can buy better equipment and you can't. No. <laughs> but, but, the, but the thing is, what if somebody can buy something that is just better, right? It's like, you know, and the thing is, I think that there's really, there is no difference. More tactical options, even if they are, say, balanced, right? So let's say you got the typical thing, slow, powerful guy and fast, weak guy, right? Okay, so if you pay money, you can have a guy who's a little bit slower and a little bit more powerful than fast, you know, slow guy. Well... He's not any better, it's balanced. So there's, there's this notion of the but Pareto Frontier. it's an extra guy. So there's a, a Pareto Frontier means that um, something is better, in, you can't make something better without making something else worse off. So if you have a, a, a character, a fast um, but really weak character, and a slow but really powerful character, which do you choose? Well, there's no real, there's, neither of them is necessarily better. But let's say that there's a character that is faster but in all ways equal to another character. Well, then you're always going to choose the faster one. So that slower one is not on the Pareto Frontier anymore. As a, as a human being, as a person, working with a simulation, a model, whatever you have, you always want to be making decisions on that Pareto frontier. You, you want the computer to automate those other decisions, and that's why you tend to see characters that fall along there. Good game designers will choose and make characters that, that hit upon there. What's interesting is when, um, in, in game mechanics, is when you have a, a, a Pareto frontier of options among different players about the different strategies you can choose. Here's a strategy that, among all three of us, is better than another one. However, individually, we can improve our own utility. We can improve how well we're doing in the game. It's not a Nash Equilibrium, or, or um, the Nash Equilibrium is different than the Pareto Frontier. That's when games get very interesting. That's when you end up with things like the Prisoner's Dilemma. Now look at like Team Fortress 2, there's almost two frontiers depending on whether or not you are leveling up. Because if you level up, you get all these items that are all balanced in rel relation to each other, but if you don't sit there and grind and level up, you have this other set of items that are just material or wor materially worse than what you can get if you level up. So now the game is not just testing FPS skill and teamwork, they added a third test. You're now also testing whether or not you are spending the time to grind out items independent of skill. I mean, but is that really fair if we're playing an RTS and I've got two kinds of Marines I can build, right? The fast, slow, the, the slow, powerful, and the fast, weak. And you've got three kind, but they're still all in the same frontier. I mean, is that a fair fight? You have an extra different guy than me. 
Well, is it that an advantage be. for you? It, it, can? It, it, it can. Now, it depends on the game, the game balance itself. And that's why you see games like, well, Akron and, and yeah. StarCraft that have different factions that feel very differently. You can balance the game, and it, it can be perfectly fine. Now, if you've plotted and, and designed the game such that here's the curves and here's all the types of units we can have, now you can start adding the variety of units. The only thing it can do is add cognitive load to you as an opponent. So you just oh. see, here's 30 different types of units. Now I have to map those and realize that this is the best counter to that. This is... Um, or this high, this combination of units is a good combo to against some other combination. But at least in that case, the information is available, so you can you know every player has the same load whether or not they have paid for this content. Well, in fact, if you, you might, pay, you, you have a higher load because now you have more options on your side as well but to you, choose when you're balancing based on your own personal skill. But you might know though that the other guy doesn't have that particular unit, so you don't have to worry about the possibility of him building it. Right. You know. Or like in uh, League of Legends, you have to pay to get like certain champions and stuff like that, right? It's like well, you might know that guy can't pick those ones, so you'll you know. You said fair. We're now we're we're assuming fair in terms of gameplay, mm -hmm. but what about the colloquial definitions of fair? Well, fair as in yeah, just I feel bad because he can use more characters. Yeah, than it's I like can we're use. only looking. We, we care about games playing and winning, right? So mm -hmm. we look at fair, and we're looking at fairness of competition. Who's going to win? Like a game of football, you know, the ref made a bad call. Now it's not fair. But this fair in terms of the world. Right? Is it fair that the guy, you know, Bill Gates can win at Magic the Gathering because he can buy ten Black Lotuses? I mean, is that fair? <laughs> right? now, Sins of a Solar Empire, anyone who's familiar with that game. I tried uh, to play it. It's there hard. was a, uh, initially, they, they had done a really good job of balancing the game. However, they didn't do a good job of communicating that balance. And so a lot of the players thought that, oh, this is overpowered and this is, this is silly. We're all annoyed. However, they're like, well, just use this counter. So if you're, you're, you've paid for a new type of unit, a new type of um, option that other people don't have that's rare, more people are not going to be used to how to counter that, and they'll perceive it as unfair, even if it is fair. Oh. Well, look at in the early days of Counter-Strike, there, there was the, the automatic shotgun. And for a long time, people decried it as being super overpowered and super unfair. But it was really just because people weren't used to dealing with it tactically. And actually, they haven't changed that gun much over the years because it was actually fair. Yeah, you, Meanwhile, I, they, I introduced, they introduced the FNP-90, which was materially unfair. It was just better. People complained the same amount about both and were just as angry about both. One was fixed just by players gaining knowledge, and one was fixed by them actually changing the game. Is there, there's no difference, though, from the player's perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, that's sort of like how my friend always complains when he plays Soul Calibur. Like, anyone using Siegfried is unfair. I can't stop, you know. He's just like, he hits me over the head with a sword and I'm dead. I don't know what to do. Well, it's like, well, you just don't know what to do. It's not a game's problem. So, There's someone who can beat that. It's just not you. So, so game balance, is it the model of selling better options to players? Like, what do you think about that? Well, it, it, comes, it boils down to an economy. I, I do believe that, that it's good to have different ways of achieving the same results. So if you spend, want to spend more time in the game um, to get those items, that's good. Otherwise, you, you have this sort of class warfare where people who have lots of money, they can buy, buy all these items. You, disin, um, you disincentivize the players who can't afford that from playing the game to begin with, and now you have more of a ritzy game, a game for people who can afford it. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? It depends on your market. depends on your target of the game. So um, I think if you're aiming for a larger audience... You're also, well, there's also a problem, though, of unfairness, where these people, they don't have to play the game. I am sitting here grinding, 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 grinding. It's not, and there's parts of the game that are not fun that I need to do to achieve those. Look at how many chaos. achievement servers there are in Team Fortress 2. I, in fact, engage in reverse griefing, where I'll join achievement servers. I don't realize they're an achievement server, and I see these people just grinding out achievements, and I start capping the flag, and people start calling me a troll and a griefer when actually I'm the only one seeking out the utility I'm asked to seek out in the game. Well, this is, this is the analogy I always make. is like, let's say in baseball, real mag major league baseball, right? Ten-year veterans are allowed to use metal bats, and anyone who pays a million dollars a year is allowed to use a metal bat, and no one else is allowed to use one. Is that, would that be fair? Well, right? Would that now this is the feel? argument we had because right. we because I was arguing, and there's a fine line. There's the idea of statefulness, which is how much of a previous game's state is carried over to the next game. For example, Counter Strike is from a mechanical design perspective, ignore the players for a second, perfectly stateless. One match of Counter Strike is completely unrelated to all other matches of Counter Strike. But you can't say that anything is stateless in this physical world. I mean, I as a player am personally getting better at the game. So I, going into the next game, have gained skill. That's, that part of the game is stateful. It's, it's in your body, though. It's, it's state that's in your physical, biological it's a, being. It's ex exogenous to the game. Right. Yes, but it still affects the game. Right. And now we're arguing about sports. 
Because I, was, I hated the fact that Team Fortress 2 went from a stateless competition, kind of like hockey, to a stateful competition. It would be as though if you won the previous game of hockey, your goalie got to wear bigger pads in the next game. <laughs> but as Dr. Ezra pointed out, it's not really that as, like that did add more statefulness to the game, but it did not make the game stateful from a stateless state. Because actually player psychology matters more in sports than any physical skill, according to tons of studies. But I mean, yeah, if you look at, you know, you just look at, you know, teams and how they're playing, and you can just see momentum matters so much more. How many wild card teams end up winning championships just because they get on a hot streak towards the end of the season? And the championship team, you know, like look at Green Bay. Are they going to win the whole thing this year? Well, maybe because they're really good, but they've been sort of going down, a little lazy mm -hmm. at the end of the season, yep. you know, and they, they're piling on the injuries because they, they, you know, they've worked so hard the whole time. Or playoffs. And the Giants, yeah, let's go. The, regu the, direction. the regular right. season of a sport is stateless, but then the playoffs are seeded based on those resu results. So they carry the state over from the regular season into the playoffs through the seeds. But now the players uh, and all the coaches know that the end game is going to be stateful, so now the stateless regular season is stateful. So you see players in the regular season, for example, the Red Wings, whenever they were winning by a lot, in the, back when they were really good in 96, 97, 98, would pull the, the Russian Five and put the B team out there to not risk injuries toward the end of the regular season. Or they would fight really hard to win regular season games that didn't actually matter to get a better seed in the playoffs. Now there's some really bizarre situations, if you look at soccer, the, the history of that, where people have been incentivized to to lose a goal and to lose a game in order to get a better or to play against different opponents in the tournament at the end. Yeah, like there, there have been famous own goals, like yes. intentional own goals, like just turn around, kick it in your own goal because you'll be better off. And, and there have been teams that have both been trying to score their own goal, but they can't because they'll be ejected if they do that. <laughs> and those games are hilarious to watch. There's only about maybe five of them out there. Yeah, you can, you can find it on YouTube. Just search for like own goal. That's my, it's one of the best things because you see all the accidental own goals. Those are awesome. So to bring it back to games, this is pers a personal thing, but I really like like I play games for direct competition. I want to play a game that is a test of skill with other players. I want us both to agree we are going to test these three skills. Let's go. And I liked Team Fortress too because while it de-emphasized FPSing skills like clicking on heads and fast movement because it's actually really slow. But it added like teamwork, like coordinating your team matters a huge deal to whether or not your team can win. So it was still fun. I filed a bug complaint with Steam when they added the hats and the weapons and everything. And the bug complaint said, you made my relatively stateless game stateful, thereby ruining it. I want my money back. And they never responded. But <laughs> as much as I like Team Fortress 2, I can't play it anymore because the whole time I'm playing, I'm thinking, these guys all have just materially better options than me solely because they have played the game more hours than me, even though my skill is independent of those hours because I played other FPSs. And it bothers me. And I don't like that monetization model as a result. So one of the things that I talked about before, anyone who, who attended my trust talk, about looking at reputation systems dynamically as a dy dynamical system. So you join a game, you have no items, you have, you're level one, whatever, and you start building up. Where, where do you end up? And do players keep on ending up indefinitely? Do they keep on building up? Is there no level cap? Or do they end up at a level at which represents their skill level or represents their commitment to the game relative to other people? Now, um, you know, maybe so like there's a... weighted grading. Right. Like or, StarCraft, you end up on some ladder. You're never going to get past that ladder. That's your limit. You're not... That, that actually brings up something else interesting. If you remember back to the, uh, the arcade games where you play a game and you see these three initials that of somebody who played the game 10 years ago who achieves a score that no one else could possibly achieve. Now, you have no incentive to play that. However, if you're playing against the same group of five people, ten people, some community that you know, and you're winning about half the time, now you're engaged. You want to keep playing. You have an incentive to keep playing. Good game companies have learned this, and that's why you tend to see a lot more ladders, a lot more matching servers you, as opposed to one big see, one. That's why when you play Bejeweled Blitz, you see your friend's scores on Facebook, but you don't see anyone else's score. Well, look exactly. at the Pac-Man Championship, the new Pac-Man game. It has the global leaderboard. You can go look at the very top of it. But I'm like by 400 something. Yeah, we're actually some of the better players in the You're world, not. which is scary. I'm close to you. I'm catching up. Anyway. <laughs> What the interesting part is that what they emphasize is they show you your ranking relative to all your friends rather than intimidating you with the top 10 that are all identical, perfect cheating scores. They were cheating scores. They were like 10 bajillion, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, they cheated. But it also, you know, the air hockey problem, we talk about this a lot, is the idea that, all right, air hockey, everyone likes air hockey. No one plays it that much. We play a whole bunch of air hockey, let's say, and we get good at air hockey. Fighting games are the exact same thing. Now we're better than everyone else around us. No one else will ever play with us again unless we go to a convention like this. So that can, affect your, that can affect the monetization model of a game where if players are forced to play with highly skilled players, they might drop out of the game because they don't want to deal with it. And conversely, the high-skilled players might get bored because they're never being challenged.
Yep. So you have to have a good matching system, or the entire game just breaks apart, and it's one of those dead, like, ruinous FPSs. Yeah, if you've got a really good guy at the Street Fighter machine, no one's gonna put a quarter in the other side. They're gonna wait for him There's to There's a leave. dude sitting in that initial D machine for, like, eight hours on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> right, and no one's gonna sit in the second seat unless to play single player, you know? And in Street Fighter, you can't play single player while the other guy's playing, you know? You have to challenge him. So it's like that you're not going to make as much money as if you have really crappy players who actually keep cycling and playing against No, he is incentivized to do that, too. In fighting games, you get a free play in the arcade if you beat somebody. So you want to be better than all your friends because then you go to the arcade, and once you've reached that skill, you can play for free for the rest of your life. And this is why you don't see those games in arcades anymore. Arcades today are filled with crane games. That's why you don't see games. arcades anymore. Well, they're filled with crane <laughs> games and video poker, right? Things that are random or luck or prize-based or, or whatever. Now that's an interesting thing too. Uh, uh, poker. How many people think poker is a game of chance? How many people think well, that poker is a game of skill? <laughs> so it, if you play it, in, in, there's there's what's known as the um, there's a the startup and there's a steady state. In a steady state, poker is a game of skill. Um, there, a colleague of mine, uh, Thomas Sandholm at Carnegie Mellon, one of his students. I'm not sure the, the current state of this project, but got uh, mathematically can prove that her agent can get within 8% of optimality for that game, meaning that it is impossible mathematically over any time horizon to beat that agent statistically by more than 8%. So there's all these games that, that may appear as a combination of, of randomness or not randomness, but as long as it's, it's mainly governed by strategy and in the long run you can win by having a better strategy, it's a strategy game. Uh, the thing with poker, though, is like, you know, if you take out the whole betting aspect, it's just playing the cards to beat the other cards, right? That it's entirely a game of chance, right? The whole game is the betting part. It has nothing to well, do with Well, you'd have to poker. assume that players understand the complete odds and are keeping perfect track all of the cards that have played through the deck in the course of the game. I guess. You can play a game ran... Okay, so let's say that you're playing tic-tac-toe and, and you're a, a five-year-old. I've used this example before. <laughs> um, Tic-tac-toe can be very complicated for that. However, let's say that you're playing with a, a die, and that'll tell you, I don't know, you have a nine-sided die, and that tells you the, the position to roll, and if that's already taken, you use another one. Now, is, uh, is tic-tac-toe a game of chance? If you're playing against somebody like that, or if you're using that as your strategy. Now, if you don't understand the game, it can look like you're playing by chance, because you don't know what move to make. You're playing chess, uh, I don't know, let me, can, is this a valid move? Is this a valid move? Now you're playing it like it's a game of chance. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so, uh, okay. well, that kind of boils down to all games. All fundamentally boil down to you know some core mechanics. Like Settlers of Catan is a game of skill up to a point. Like you, if, as you learn the game, you learn optimal strategies. The game is actually pretty. I think it is possible to play Settlers of Catan optimally because the rule set is pretty constrained. There's you don't have a lot of options on a given turn. The deck is simple. The the, the odds are two d six. I think everyone at this con knows two d six odds by heart at this point. So as a result, if four perfectly skilled players play, the game is perfectly random because it does just come down to the role of the 2d6. Now this is something else very interesting, where before I was talking about a game that looks random and then when you get skilled becomes a strategy game. You can have the same thing, or the opposite thing, where you have a game that starts off as strategy, but then once you get to that Nash Equilibrium, you understand the Nash Equilibrium, everyone else does, that's your best strategy. Now it's just rock, paper, scissors. We should ex does that, anyone here, a Nash Equilibrium to, simply is the idea that you can have a game where all of us are playing a game. We all have made a move. I know that any change to my strategy will be worse than I currently am. Even if I'm not winning with my current strategy, I will do worse if I change my move. I will never change my move. There are games that, as many games, can get to a point where every player is at that point and no one will ever make another different decision forever. If two of us change our strategy, maybe we can mix it up, but neither of us but then, is an individually competitive game. Mm -hmm. Neither of us is going to make a move. Now, it also depends whether or not the game is cooperative or not. Cooperative is whether or not you can make binding deals in a game. Yeah, if I can make a binding deal, let's say Dr. Hazard's winning, because he probably will be. Me and Rim are losing, <laughs> but we can't do any better. But I can say, Scott, let's both go here... Let's agree to it, and there's an outside force, either the rules of the game, a guy with a gun, something, right. that will force so us to actually move, do it. We both move together to put ourselves ahead, and now we're at a different Nash Equilibrium, and maybe one of us, too, is winning. But then we really weren't at an Equilibrium because we did have a cooperative option. Right, exactly, yes, and that's yeah. part of the game mechanic itself. There are, there's also a notion of K-strong Nash Equilibrium, which means that you cannot, um, no group of size less than K can collude together, can make these binding agreements, and win or, or disrupt the Equilibrium. So think about what this does to the design of a game. Like, Risk is not a cooperative game. There is, if I make a deal, like, I won't attack you next round, there's no rule about that. There's nothing to stop you me from attacking attack me him. You just attack me next round. 
he but, will. But a game like Small World, if I play the diplomacy thing, that is a bind. That deal is binding. That is a mechanic of the game. He cannot attack me. The rules break it. Is the world cooperative or not? Is government cooperative or not? What about politics? What about what about our society? Oh, because we sign a contract. For all intents and purposes, the world is cooperative because there are legal structures, there's laws, there's police, there's all these things that will enforce that contract. But really, those are only there by force. And if I had enough force, or I left the country or something, I could still get out of the contract, theoretically. Now, most games, in, 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 they're not trivial, are some, more, some hybrid between cooperate cooperative and competitive. You can only find the extreme in certain situations. Look at World War I. You had these guys who were doing all this trench warfare, and they didn't The real war, kill. not the, the board real game. war, yes. Uh, there were guys who were firing off mortars at, the, at certain times every day, and they would, do it, um, they would schedule when they would fire in the specific locations so they could tell their, off their officers, hey, we're firing, look at all these rounds we fired, but they weren't hitting their opponents. Their opponents could move out of the way. They would both do that, so they were playing tit for tat and being nice. Right, that's, that's, the, that's the utility structure. That's cooperation in war. Because look at the officer's utility, win the war. Soldier's utility, don't die. So the, the soldiers on German side, the, the, the non-commissioned officers had a different utility from the grunts, the infantrymen. The infantrymen on both sides had the same utility and actually had a lot more in common than everyone else involved in the war. Right, this is, has almost nothing to do with our panel yeah, at this yeah, point. Let's, let's, go, <laughs> let's go back to money making. So, so complete, complete reversal, right? So one, another thing I've noticed that makes a lot of difference in, uh, we're almost done by the way, in uh, how games make money is like what platform the games are on. See, a board game versus a handheld game versus the console versus the PC. Board games are interesting in that they are trivially pirated. You can look up the rules and make the game. People don't realize that board game piracy is actually kind of big. I, like I met a guy the first time I really modern art. I was like, oh, look at these Van Gogh paintings and stuff. That guy just made that set of modern art by himself. He printed it out of his printer, and he, got, he bought some poker chips, and he's just like, yeah, and he bought a deck of cards, he wrote on the cards, and that was, you know, modern art. But yet, board games still make money because it's kind of a pain in the ass to do it. It's, re like it's, it's really trivial to do it if you want to do it, but at the same time, most people aren't willing to do yeah, it. The rules to pretty much every board game are free online, so if you just buy a big sack of, like, pieces, like, you know, some, some, some plastic spaceships, some chips, some gems, some little wooden cubes and some dice of all different shapes and sizes, and a board that you can draw on and a, and a color printer, you can make almost any board game and carry them around in just one box, like every board game in the world. And there, there are two reasons why consoles have, have become popular by developers. One is you have a unified platform that you don't have to worry about all these bugs from all the different configurations of PCs. Two is piracy. When you're playing a console game, it, the burden of pirating a game is that much higher. You have to get a mod chip, you have to do all these different sorts of things. And all the handheld devices are being locked down. You have to root your phone if you want to install other stuff that isn't sanctioned by the companies. And on top of that, they have an incentive to, for these walled gardens, as they're called, where Apple started it, and now as a developer, I have to pay 30% of my revenue, there's a little asterisk there because different companies charge different amounts, to have the blessing of them to sell on their platform. So that's 30% of my revenue gone in order to... To sell the game. Right, but are you gonna, if you were to say to put it out DRM free, right, mm -hmm. would you, you know, on Android, which actually has more numbers than Apple now, right? I guess you have to handle all the different Android OSs and phones out there, which is a pain in the butt. Right. But even if you didn't, would you make more money not giving up the 30% cut, even though people are pirating, you know? So that's, that's an interesting question. Because piracy, mm -hmm. ba piracy basically, like, you know, I'm, not, I'm one of those people who doesn't believe piracy actually cuts into sales, except for the fact that piracy basically acts as a demo. You know, we know mm -hmm. a demo cuts into sales, mm -hmm. right? So if you don't put out a demo, but there's piracy, it's basically like, well, you lose the sales you would have lost with the demo. Right. It, it's a complicated answer. As before, I was talking about price discrimination over time, right. and ideally you want the people to not pirate, but just wait a little bit longer to buy it. But piracy eats into that and cuts off the tail of your revenue. Yep, especially because if, as piracy gets easier, people just download and play it, play the, play the demo, they're done. Mm -hmm. I pirated, uh, I think it was in Poker Night of the Inventory. I pirated that. I watched all the cutscenes on YouTube. You didn't actually download a pirated copy of the game. You just watched it. I did that for a lot of Final Fantasy games and like games with FMVs. It's like, I don't want to sit there grinding for 10 hours. Just watch Final Fantasy VIII on YouTube. I'm done. Cool. Did I, should I have paid for that? I don't actually believe so. And I don't feel bad. One fascinating thing to me is that different game developers' takes on YouTube. Some game developers hate any of their FMVs, anything being posted on YouTube. Other ones like me, like, hey, sure, put it up there. It's promotion yeah. for our game. 
Well, like, here's an interesting example. Look around on YouTube for how many My Little Pony mashups there are. <laughs> Nana, then look for how many Archer mashups there are, or other very, very popular shows. There's very little because the companies that own those properties take everything down at a moment's notice. There aren't just clips of all the funny things that happen in shows like Archer on YouTube because they get taken down. Yeah, you don't see too They're many... all on Hulu where it's a pain in the ass to watch them because they show you an ad before every 20 second clip. You don't see too many Seinfeld and Simpsons mashups because any Seinfeld or Simpsons thing on YouTube is going to be taken down immediately. I, I made a My Little Pony mashup with Seinfeld. I zoomed in and reversed the video just to make sure I wouldn't get caught by the filter. Yeah, you can't tell me that, you know, I mean, sure, we don't have any statistics on this, but you can't tell me in My Little Pony that, you know, everyone would be selling MLP merch and cosplaying as ponies if YouTube wasn't full of a million mashups. But at the same time, right. where's the monetization model there? Because you still have to make money in the end, and so far, we've poked holes through every possible model of monetization. Well, if you want to talk about ponies, there's plenty of monetization models. They're just not doing it, right? It's like, that's, that's something that I really don't understand, is not just when, okay, we have a thing, we want to make money off of it, trying different things, but it's, here's an obvious free money, and they're just ignoring the, it's not even risk-taking. It's mm -hmm. obvious free money not taking it. For example, old game that is extremely popular, popular that's just not available on any market, so you have to pirate it. For example, Saturn Bomberman. You can't buy Saturn Bomberman except used. I would pay but like 20 I mean, bucks for that right now. Yeah. So here, this is something we haven't really talked about much, is IP, intellectual property. There's trademarks, copyrights, and patents. Those but are the three Somebody, forms. Somebody does own it. Right. That person could be making some amount of money. Even if they put it out for a penny, they would make something on that. So the, the, the trouble there is that a lot of the distribution. Because if the distributors take a huge amount of cut and here you have to go through all these hoops, you have to pay somebody for 100 hours of their time to figure out all the legal stuff, get the licensing set up. They may make less money on selling it than it costs for all of that over. Movies have that problem. There are thousands of movies that either never saw the light of day or were screened a couple of times and disappeared because the right structure of who owns what parts of the movie and the soundtrack and all these pieces mean that there is no way anyone would ever spend the money it would take to sort it out to legally release it. Game mechanics are another interesting thing. You can't, uh, we're, we're up. Are we, we're out? I think we're out. It's all right. Oh, we were going to make a really good point too, but I guess we're out of time. <laughs> Yeah, so, so game mechanics are not copyrightable, but the technology and algorithms underneath them are patentable. So that's another interesting can of worms. Yes, and then there's the idea of reverse engineering game mechanics on your own and then making a game that's the same. Well, there's also the thing like the art in a game, right? Like, you know, I look at Dominion, right? You know, I can't just photocopy a Dominion and sell it, right? Because I'm using the art that is copyrighted by the people who made that set. But if I make a game that's the exact same game as Dominion, and I just draw all my own art and design my own cards and my own boxes, I can get away with that, almost. So we've got to get out of the room, but I think if you enjoyed this at all, I guess all of us do stuff outside of these cons, so I guess you can buy plug, plug, on... plug what you do, and we'll Acron plug what we game. do. Acrongame.com. Search for Acron. It's a time-traveling RTS. Send tanks back in time to destroy it's the things that the made the tanks that were attacking your base. I can't even beat the tutorial. I suck. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. I can't beat the tutorial. And pretty much all of our other lectures where we argue that World of Warcraft is not an MMORPG <laughs> and that the communities around games are actually mathematical extensions of the games themselves. A shitty community in a game is, a, is caused by the game, not by the people playing it. All of our lectures are on YouTube, and hopefully all this stuff will be on YouTube, too. All right. Very good. Thank you.